welcome everyone to the National Council of Interpreting and Healthcare's podcast. This is a podcast coming to you for you by the, the Standards and Training Committee. And this podcast is really intended for everyone working in our healthcare interpreter industry to be able to promote language access and social justice and to join in in important conversations that need to be had. And we wanna make sure that your voices are being heard and we're hearing from the creme de la creme of our industry. And I'm really excited to be sitting here today virtually with Carla Fogaren, who is a true pioneer in our industry. And I'll give a quick bio. I'm gonna shorten her bio because otherwise we might might be here uh, all morning. But, um, but Carla has served as the system director of diversity initiatives and interpreter services an ADA 504 and Section 1557 coordinator for a large healthcare system with 42 hospitals, 6,000 providers in 11 states. She's worked, served on countless boards and been a huge advocate in our industry and done a lot of collaboration here with the NCIHC. So Carla, it's an honor to have, have you here and thank you for joining us today. You're very welcome. And honestly, what an introduction. <laughs> thank you well so on this podcast it's a little little bit different our, our podcast is interpreting for healthcare and in this this episode we we talk about just three questions just kind of get to know you better and learn more from your experiences in our healthcare interpreter industry so question number one are you ready yes all right so looking back what are you most proud of well that's a tough question to answer but i would say maybe the two things I'm most proud of uh, as it relates to the industry is really, you know, becoming involved and becoming involved in organizations that support language industry and social justice and the rights of patients. As a registered nurse, that's fundamental to the core of who I am. Uh, but as an interpreter myself, you know, I became involved in the IMIA, then the MMIA back then, that's how old I am. And then at NCIHC, I'm currently the vice president for the NCIHC. But the reality is I always have believed that if you don't get involved, you really can't impact change. You know, and there are a lot of people that will talk about things, but we really need all of the energy to come together and to volunteer for a work committee or anything, or even sharing your opinion or what you're seeing in the industry. So I'm really proud of the fact that I've been able to contribute in some way even if it's in a small way, to that level of discussion. The second thing that I'm probably uh, the most proud of, in all honesty, is the fact that I created um, an interpreter program with just me, 24 hours uh, a week, in 1993. And it grew to over 42 hospitals and in 11 states with 3,000 physician practices. And that to me was extremely challenging, but at the same time, very rewarding because I was able to, to leave last year, but felt like I had left things in a much better way than before. And I really feel, and I'm not trying to, to toot my own horn, but I just feel that our providers, our staff and our patients are in a better place as a result of all the hard work that myself and my team did. So that to me is a little legacy that I feel very proud of. As, as you should, excellent. And the, the second question I have for you is you're looking at the, our healthcare interpreter industry. What do you see right now, Carla, as the biggest challenge that we are facing? There's a lot of them, um, but I think the biggest challenge that I see, and one of the reasons, frankly, that I left after 34 years in working in a position that I truly enjoyed and loved uh, is that healthcare is changing so rapidly. And, um, you know, there's less time for patients, there's less money to do things in, uh, there's staffing shortages, the pandemic really, um, highlighted all of those things. And to me, I think that's the biggest challenge is how do we become efficient or remain efficient? Um, and, you know, the whole productivity thing, which is extremely important as well, without losing that nuance that we're dealing with human beings, both from the patient perspective, but the provider perspective, and then equally important, the interpreter perspective. So I think we've become a little bit of uh, 
we just don't know how to behave anymore as human beings in that type of very stressful environment. And I think we need to put the humanity back into it. Um, and I think we're losing that a little bit, you know? I mean, uh, I see that from a clinical perspective. Uh, it's not that people wake up all of a sudden and say, I can't wait to tick off my first Spanish speaking patient or, you know, today I'm gonna do substandard surgeries. It's not anything like that. It's just, there's not enough time in the day for the amount of work and documentation that is now required. Uh, and I think, you know, as interpreters and as translators, we're being challenged equally because we have to keep up with the pace that the provider is keeping up with. So oftentimes I remember even when I was interpreting, it would be like, let's go, let's go, like, you, let's move faster. Or we don't really have time for those questions. And, you know, it puts us in a situation that you know that that patient's not getting equal or the same level of care as maybe the English speaker. And the English speakers are suffering as well you know, because everything's condensed. But I think that's the biggest challenge. And I think it's going to continue to be a little bit more challenging until things right size themselves. I'm really, really hopeful. I've never seen momentum like this, David, with all sorts of state agencies, federal agencies, um, payers, all coming together and literally saying, this is going to be tied into your pay for performance. And we want health equity standards. A lot of them are based around language access. Uh, from CMS, from NCQA, from Medicaid, uh, from state government. So I'm really excited because I think the planets and the stars are all finally aligned and we should jump on this momentum and, and, and make sure that our voices are heard. Yeah, you articulated that really well. It's like, how do we create efficiencies, but still, still increase, increase that quality. And that's the, that's such a, such a challenge but the, the way to do it like just like you said is, is by having certain metrics in place where it has to be because right. otherwise um there won't be an incentive to do so so looking forward by this is the, our, our final question for today carla so looking forward as you look at our healthcare interpreter industry what would you love to see happen what's something you'd love to see see change moving forward so as you know the labor of uh the Bureau of Labor Statistics predicts that our number of medical interpreter jobs is going to increase by at least 20% by 2031. I don't think we have enough interpreters necessarily for certain languages. I'd love to see languages of rare diffusion uh, get expanded, uh, more attention being paid to those communities, to the communities of deaf and hard of hearing patients. But to me, again, it kind of ties into your second question. I feel that there are interpreters out there that could literally control their destiny a little bit better. And by that, I mean, they should continue learning. They should get nationally certified. They should also embrace technology. You remember the days when everybody was up in arms when it was like telephone interpreters, then video interpreters. That's going to take our jobs. You know, what's going to happen to our world, you know? And in all honesty, look at what's happened. You know, we've had so many more interpreters that are hired, that are working, and are working across all three mediums, right, On in-person, uh, OPI, and uh, through video. So I think we constantly have to assess and change our mindset and saying, okay, what's the next and newest thing to come? And are we ready to embrace it, or are we ready to at least put some guardrails up on it so that we can work within what's best for the patient? For instance, artificial intelligence. That's the next thing. That's here. It's not coming, it's here. So how do we as people in the language industry, both as interpreters, translators, uh, you know, work in understanding the good, the bad, and the ugly of artificial intelligence? Because it's a powerful tool. And I think, you know, it can definitely have its benefits, but we have to make sure that we don't repeat all of the things with all of the biases that we've seen in clinical algorithms and everything else. So for interpreters, I just challenge you to remain open to learn, to also not come from it as a defensive thing, but see it as an opportunity because you're not gonna be able to change the outcome. These types of technical advances are here. We don't do cardiac surgery today the same way we did it a year ago even. So we too have to adjust our sales accordingly. And I think that's the hardest thing. I personally would love to see more on-site interpreters um, I think that the relationships that were built with patients in our linguistic communities uh, can't always be built in the same way, but
But that being said, we cannot function without our um, colleagues that are remote in any fashion. I mean, the pandemic proved that. But I, I would hope that most hospitals will keep their on-site interpreters. We're seeing quite a few hospitals shut down their on-site programs. And I think that they're going to find that they'll regret that to a certain extent because patients truly connect as human beings. And to have the same interpreter follow you through because there's only maybe 10 for that hospital and you kind of get to know the interpreter, they get to know you, you work as a team, uh, with as a clinical team, the interpreter and the providers. I think I'd like to see a little bit more of that, but I think I'm being very optimistic in that view. I think we're going to continue to see things change, you know. Uh, but I challenge all of the interpreters and my colleagues, just keep an open mind, learn, challenge yourself, don't be complacent, you know, uh, because other people are going to surpass your knowledge and your skill set. And you always need to be the very best interpreter that you can be to provide quality care for that patient. It was a great outlook, Carla, and I really, really appreciate hearing directly from you uh, on on what you what you see needs to needs to change. It's very very inspiring, and it's a it's a huge benefit to our community, to all the healthcare interpreters and and translators, and medical providers listening in. Uh, we just thank you for all of your your years of, of service in our industry, for your passion, for mm -hmm. just how much you care, and just what, and what a pioneer you've you, you've been and continue to be in our industry. Uh, on behalf of the NCIHC and the Standards and Training uh, Committee, we just uh, thank you for for joining us today, and we just thank you for the the relationship and all your leadership that you uh, you do in our industry. My sincere pleasure. I'll be seeing you around, David. Seeing you soon, Carla. Okay. Well, thank Pardon you. Me. Have a nice day. You too.